Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lakshmi's Leadership Lounge. Um, as you know, the future of work is changing. And now more than ever is the time we evaluate the way we lead to prepare ourselves for it. So this is why we bring you a series that showcases a plethora of leaders who have inspired us by redefining the way they lead. Join me, Lakshmi Prakuri, on this journey as I take a deep dive into the lives of these trailblazers and their unique take on leadership. Today, our guest is uh, Deepa Singh Bagai. She's an international uh, civil servant who has worked with the United Nations, providing policy advice and supporting development programs in over 22 countries for more than three decades. She has previously worked with the Indian Administrative Service and also with the World Bank. She has an MPhil in developmental economics from uh, the Sorbonne uh, University and fluent in Hindi, Urdu, English, and French. Uh, she's a connoisseur of traditional music and Urdu poetry and art, handicraft, textiles, and embroideries. You know, her passion really is working with communities on eco-friendly living, sustainable waste management, and greening urban spaces for environmental sustainability. And she does this all by uh, bringing the whole community together in the most possible and fun way. So I'm really excited for all of you to meet Deepa Bagai. Deepa, can you please join us? Great. Hello. Hello, um, Lakshmi. It is such a pleasure to see you. Thank yeah, you very nice much. To, yeah, have you join us from your home in Noida? And uh, so Deepa, I'm most interested in talking about, there are so many aspects of you uh, that I want to talk about today. Uh, you know, you've been a very, very pioneering woman in the administrative services and really being in civil leadership, you know. So during your professional journey, you know, you've been an international civil servant, you worked all over the world. Uh, you've had many, many leadership roles. So which leadership style that has most appealed to you and your sensibilities? That is such an interesting question, Lakshmi, because when I look back to being a 25-year-old and having almost a leadership position thrust on me, you know, when one joins the Indian Administrative Service, it's a very empowering and a very powerful position. And a lot of your leadership derives from the power or the position that you have. But that's so small when you look at the, you know, the 30, 37 years of a professional career. And I find that that is probably the smallest part of leadership. The real leadership, in fact, or the opportunity that I've had to influence or to change anything has really not come at all from positions. That was very early on when, you know, being a young IS officer, a woman in a state like Uttar Pradesh, very difficult, tough environment for women. And in that situation, even there, the power which came from the position wasn't leadership. Whenever I had the opportunity of making a real change and connecting with people. That was when I felt that there was a huge satisfaction. And that one word which describes that is really not leadership. I think I would like to call it as empathy. And whenever, as I grew older and I started to understand that I was so blessed and privileged to be in that position where getting empathy and looking at people's problems and thinking of what one could do to solve them. That, that was where it started. But the journey has been incredible, Lakshmi, I have to say that. Because yes. from there, when I went into the international civil serv services, when I was working with the World Bank or with the UN, I have to say that added a new dimension to my work. And mm -hmm. what was very interesting was that that whole paradigm of power, hierarchy, of being 
of being assuming your power from the position that you have that changed and kept yeah. changing and that has right. been such an enriching journey for me yeah and, and now you know, i find true. that yeah no I, right. I, I, i find that to it to be to for me to be in a very very good place yeah you know i i worked at intel for 12 years and then i left and uh, i used to joke with my friends that now i know who are my real friends like when i call who will call me back you know <laughs> it's not even that i had the power in that position it's the access you have to others who have decision makers so um, you know it's really enriching to um, you know to expand your network based on the relationships and not just on the position of the uh, that you occupy and you know while you're doing all this you know with so many different countries experiences what are some primary areas you think uh, we need to consider um, while working towards sustainable development goals because this is what the united nations has said so what are some of the areas you you are most interested in uh, to move toward sdgs i mean this is such a good time to raise the question of sustainability we are embarking on the un decade of sustainability and this whole pandemic has just taught us how important it is that we look at our whole lifestyle our whole environment our whole ecosystem as that it is one of those things where sustainability has to be at the crux of this mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i find that everything apart if we look at what we are doing and think of it as what is it that is going to be left behind when we are not there and yeah. we create around us an environment and ecosystem that understands and responds to that that's what is the the real challenge is to be able to create that ecosystem which is sustainable and which is not driven by you know doing something here or something there or exploiting the environment in a sense or exploiting your situation or power or whatever you call it but working with it alongside it as a partner and in that sense i think it's so important that whatever we do we look at it as how is it going to impact our world and our lives and our lifestyles in the coming years and i think the pandemic has been a huge huge lesson for all of us and yeah. in a way it's you know it's the best of times and it's the worst of times i know and i think uh, we just have to take the best of it yeah no i think you bring out a very good point uh, adipa about uh, you know integrating sustainability into lives into our lives you know not just it as one thing that we do so um what are the ways in which you yourself have managed to embed sustainability throughout your work uh, while you're leading teams you know what are the ways in which we can do that okay so that that that's an interesting way of looking at things because one of the things that i find i mean the area of my my work has especially been you know capacity development in developing the enabling environment institutional frameworks accountability mechanisms now all of these we find that it's very easy to create an organization or to create a structure but that is not what is enough it it's a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition to get results so what we are finding unfortunately is that in many many situations we are replicating we are doing something that we call isomorphic mimicry so the structure is there in its complete glorious form and unfortunately the form is there but it's not able to deliver on the function and when that's not happening then it's never going to be sustainable so you can create a wonderful hospital you can have a building you can put the beds there you can do everything i mean there are instances in so many parts of the of the world where the infrastructure has been created and yet we have not been able to make it sustainable because we haven't got the right people we haven't got the right talent we haven't been able to bring to it the empathy the accountability 
the delivery of what that structure is supposed to do so the function has not followed form so yeah. we've become in many cases we've become like i wouldn't say failing states but flailing states just running around various parts of the body politic are moving and yet it's not delivering what it's supposed to deliver and then you know it leads to all those issues of numbers being fudged people being harassed and yeah. all that problem comes if the structure is not sound enough and has not been designed with that sustainability in mind where it's not just about creating an organization but about keeping all the time front and center that why is it there what is it supposed to do is it doing what it's supposed to do and being able to constantly reinvent improve and analyze diagnose and continuously work towards that improvement i think that yeah. is something which which is really really important i think uh, it, the point i want to underscore that's really important here when we say sustainability a lot of times we think about uh, do we have plastic cups or do we have paper cups you know in you, what you're talking about is sustainability of an organization when you set something up have we thought about how will this run for the next 10 years not for the next year have we thought about uh, you know developing the next level of leaders have we thought about the processes and checks and balances and i think that's a very very important point so in your uh, background you know especially when you worked in un etc has there been a eureka moment for you uh, you know from your work that ah this is what it means you know to accomplish something okay so that uh, you know there are some examples there are some times when that happens and yeah. one of those things is when you know you have the un is very often called the biggest talking shop in the world the world bank is considered one of the you know wonderful places for excellent analytical work excellent diagnostic work but when you see some of that being translated into something which changes people's lives on the ground and when you see that happening that has been the eureka moment i i'll give you an example we ran a very very interesting workshop it was in bhutan one of the prettiest most beautiful places in the world and i mean a great example of sustainability and it was about being able to organize good nutritious meals for school children and lots of countries were there sharing their experiences i was at that time working with the world food program pakistan was represented there as were many other, as the other countries from south asia when everybody was presenting their experiences the representative from pakistan said actually that this is making me think that if a country like bhutan a country like nepal can have a really good strong program and can provide a nutritious meal to their school children why is it that a province like punjab in pakistan which is the granary of that of that region is not able to do that and found that you know school girls in south punjab they were not being i mean they were not school girls because they were not being able to get to school and when they were getting to school there was really nothing for them to do there and a wonderful program of providing school meals to uh, girls in pakistan in the five districts of south punjab started as a pilot and it was amazing to see how it actually transformed people's lives and when i went there some years later and met some of the girls who had actually changed the trajectory of their lives because of those conversations i mean that for me was huge because that was like okay it's not only about talking but it's about making the connections creating the partnerships providing the resources and like you said creating something which is sustainable and which can actually take you to a world where things actually can change for someone right. i mean it means the world to someone correct and on and it's also the ability to bring the kind of people who can actually make things happen it's you know a lot of us are emotionally engaged but 
we may not be able to move things at such a large scale but someone who has the authority to do it is really really amazing if you can inspire them um and deepa if someone were to hear you i mean meet you uh, like i did i mean you're so impressive you know in terms of your accomplishments you're very articulate you're very uh, gra- uh, gracious etc i'm sure you had some tough times in your career also you know there was a time you went through where you had to fight the bureaucracy there were there been allegations against you etc my question to you as especially for the young leaders is that you will face a very very challenging time in your career at some point or the other how did you face it how did you handle it okay uh how did you know that i mean it's really literally like you put your finger on it and you're very kind to say all those nice things about me but i have had some of the toughest possible times absolutely the toughest fighting the system where it was really really hard at a very personal level so it hurt it hurt deeply but what kept me going was keeping the faith believing in myself and having around me a group of people my friends my family and certain mentors who had stood by me who actually gave me the strength to be able to literally rise from the ashes so i think for the young people it's really important that they are able to leverage the strength that they get from being around other leaders around other people around strong pillars in their families i mean i come from a family of very strong women also very strong men but what's nice about that is that we are there for each other i mean the support has been absolutely absolutely unflinching the belief and just standing behind you it's literally sort of given you the wind under the wings make you fly yeah. and yeah. for young people it's really important it's actually you know now basically i think people like you and i our generation that has to recognize that and at one level we say that young people are getting very introverted in a sense even though i mean there's a huge social media world out there for them they are otherwise you know in a way very alone and i think that's where we have to really really kind of you know bring all our efforts together i mean i personally get so much energy myself from being with young people that it's yeah. absolutely yeah. incredible right that's one of the things which you know when i've come back after working in so many different parts of the world and coming back to india i have found myself working with the community and mm-hmm. it's that kind of you know that lots of young people there lots of people my age but that has actually changed the paradigm for me so yeah the tough times just go away and all these you know big energy giving positive things happen around me and i feel so wonderful so um you know we are actually going through india is going through a tough time uh, with covid uh, etc and it's you know turning it around so if you i mean that is also sustaining human life right sustainability in, in a big way so if you were to put the 2050 glasses uh, uh deepa what are the things we need to do today to maybe still continue to exist in 2050 or you know to really um embrace everything that india could be and to move there what are some of the things do you think we need to do today and what do you see in 2050 you know what's your perspective for me lakshmi i think one of the most important things is to change the way we do things and when i say that i mean the power of the community is what we have to harness very very strongly and in a way that we've not done before i mean the pandemic has shown clearly i mean how much the the people outside of the government it was the communities the republic of self help it was called at that time so 
it's the community engagement that is really critical and in that community engagement i find there are two areas which are absolutely one is i mean they're absolutely key to what we'll see in the world in 2050 one is caring for our environment and in that the sub part of it is managing our waste one of the big big problems that i find is that and that's going to impact and impinge on every part of our life and the second part is of course the broader environmental sustainability the greening the absolute absolute necessity of being able to address the key issue of a planet of an earth that is denuded you know and then all the things that it leads to all the climate change issues all the other problems so those yeah. i think are the two absolutely key areas and when i talk about community i think i really have to share with you that when i have come back here and i found myself you know i'm surrounded by people whose potential is absolutely amazing to be able to harness that potential for us i mean leadership is not anything i i don't even actually like that word leader now yeah. really has kind of all kinds of connotations even but facilitation and enabling that is something that is allowing us to be able to help others realize what they can do i think you had asked earlier on that lots of us want to do things but when we find ourselves in an environment where partnerships networking enabling and facilitation happen magic can happen so we I formed a group hope. called the green crusaders yeah. our green crusaders are just absolutely phenomenal women some of them are housewives some of them are professionals doctors teachers uh and yet together we have been able to do things which many of these people and myself would have not thought possible so i think that kind of power that we have got from the community which the community gives to each other and it's that partnership of the community with the government agencies that is actually able to do because government i think at this point in india is not going to be able to do all alone everything that needs to be done in the country so yeah. i think that's very important and i think to just wrap this section up i must say that i think it's people like you who are public servants who are stepping into their communities and the communities that are raising to uh, raising their voices to bring people together it takes us all you know it's not any one entity's uh, responsibility and i want to say that you know one of the things i've really inspired by you is how you always bring people together it's not just about your journey uh, for these green crusaders you got so many women children everybody involved and then use your position power to bring the government in and bring uh, other civil organizations in because i think that's where uh, the magic can happen is you tapping into every aspect of your network to make something bigger um so with that deepa i want to say we conclude this section and we go to the next section where you get to ask me questions it's a stop me if you can section feel free to ask anything okay so we have talked so much about you know what our india is at this time and what it's becoming So I think the question I have for you is if you had a magic wand what is it what are the two things that you would like to change using that magic wand in the india that we find ourselves in today you know to to me there are two, two groups that are most interesting to me one is the next generation the youth um and when i say youth anybody under 40 you know because i think once you're 35 or 40 you're really set in your ways uh, and i really would like to train this generation um you know you're absolutely right what is leadership is it's completely changing in the future it's not about somebody who holds information or a position power all those things are going to go it's really about how agile you are about learning engaging with others forming unusual partnerships 
So I think we need to develop our next generation of leadership to be very interdisciplinary, uh, intergenerational, and, uh, uh, and interfaith, interbelief. You know, we need to create a very, very diverse uh, set of leaders who bring various values, but also know how to work with people who are very different. I think the industrial age has made us all very, um, you know, specialized and even parochial to some extent. And I, this That's pandemic true. has shown us, you know, it has no geographical boundaries, no social boundaries, no caste boundaries, nothing. It can affect anyone, anywhere. And we are all working across countries, across ages, across everything to solve it. And I love if I could wave a magic wand and educate everyone in a completely different way, in an experiential way um, of, um, uh, uh, of uh, being a more holistic leader. You know, that's the first thing. I really, really want to do. And the second thing I'm most passionate about, you touched on this also, is women. You know, uh, women are not just in India, in this world, we are over 50% of this earth, but we have consistently trained women to always be in support roles. I mean, we have, as a culture across the globe, by calling the women the nurturers, the mothers, I mean, we put them into this whole thing of, uh, you know, if things are going wrong, you should be the one who saves everybody, you know, always put yourself behind, take care of everyone else. So I really would like for doing something where every woman has her own identity beyond being a wife or a mother or, you know, whatever it is. I love being a green I love being, uh, you know, reading books or I love, you know, whatever. I would like to create a world where each woman has her own identity and a very clear understanding of her part in economics um, of this world. Because by staying home and raising kids, a woman is contributing hugely to the economics of that family. Uh, the amount of money that's saved from nannies and this and yeah. that is you know if you if you really put money to it it's really really huge um so these are the two things you know how next generation of leadership which is very very interdisciplinary and global and women really to give a voice to women to say it's okay to say i want i mean it's just okay to say that you know i would love to see a world where these two things uh, can happen and, uh, and and what a, what what a absolutely glorious world that would be, Lakshmi. Yes. And you know, yeah. when you were talking about the experience, that you know, that's experiential thing and absorbing everything and then giving it back. And yeah. I'm reminded of this wonderful poem, which kind of comes back to me all the time. And it says, like, yes. you know, it's Ulysses and the lines, famous lines that I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever as I move. So it's just so fantastic to be able yes. to be in that position and, yes. you know, yeah. have that wand to see that beautiful world gleaming. Yeah. My second question is uh -huh. about a very direct one, again, about India. And that is, are you bearish or bullish on India at this point? You know, my uh, father had a great term um, that would describe him, which also describes me, is that hopeless optimist, you know. So, <laughs> it's sort of, mm -hmm. I think, I don't, you know, bearish, bullish, these are all financial terms, you know. I mean, I can say I'm bullish, at times bearish, you know, blah, blah, all these things. But I feel everything in life, and especially India for me, is not just because I'm from there. It's because it has the largest number of youth population in this world. You know, it has over 600 million or 700 million people who are under the age of 35, who are going to be living for another 40, 50 years. So to me, India represents that land where the future lays just because 
of the demographic dividend, you know. So I have to be optimistic about India because if I'm not optimistic about India, I'm not optimistic about the youth. And if I'm not optimistic about the youth, I'm not optimistic about the future. And having said that, I think we need to be cautious. We need to make sure that we keep up the positive spirit and take everybody along and mend our ways uh, a lot. And again, not just as India, as a globe, we have created a very, very inequitable world. Um, and today, you know, something, you know, we were meeting with Professor Yunus and he was talking about something like 5% of the world controlling 80% of the, you know, influence, etc. It's incredibly inequitable. So in India, uh, you know, or for the, what happens in India is what happens in the world because that's where the youth lives. So we need to be incredibly optimistic uh, about India and making sure we take everybody along. So that's why I'm in One, India. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Not just because I'm from there, because of the number of young people who are there who we need to nurture and treasure and save and support and actually get out of the way. Our young people know what to do. We just need to get out of the way. Yeah. And just kind of support from the sides, be there for them and yeah. just let them run with it. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, Deepa, with that, we come to the last section, which is called the Ink Tree Seed. And this is our, uh, you know, there's one thing I think if we are greedy about is collecting great minds and continuing to engage with them. So we don't want our conversation to stop right here in these 30 minutes. So the Ink Tree Seed is an idea where we say, hey, here are the things we are doing. Can you be involved? So I want to, you know, one of the things we are doing with our Ring fellow Manvendra uh, is develop a whole new sustainable city outside Jaipur called Dhun. Um, and, you, you know, Dhun.life has all the details. And it's really, really amazing for me uh, that a very successful hotelier, um, you know, wants to engage in something so long term and has such a long term vision. Um, it's when sustainable, it just doesn't mean, um, you know, let's plant a few trees. It's really, really a very different mindset. I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about developing something from scratch and also to be part of that journey? Lakshmi, it would be an absolute pleasure and honor. Like I said, the energy one gets from being with young people, from being with a project, or from being with the seed of an idea which you see the potential of, I mean, it would be an absolute, absolute win-win for me. As I mean, it would be something which I would love to do. And I'm there with whatever. I mean, I, I've reached a point in my career, in my life, where I am absolutely not embarrassed about picking up the phone and asking people to do things because it's not absolutely. for me. Yeah. So I'm yeah. happy to do that whenever I can. Not only pick up the phone, but be there myself. Pick up whatever is needed and carry on. Because I think these are the kind of things that really give the hope that you're looking for. That you're saying is what, what inspires you, what keeps you optimistic. And what, you know, what, what, what helps us to think that we are here for a purpose and, you know, we are going to leave this world a better place. Wonderful. So we are setting up a big ink imagination center there where people can come together dream of things stay there and be part of building this together so i'm really really uh, thankful you're going to be part of it we're going to arrange for you to visit the place soon and uh, i know you'll definitely be uh, inspired by it uh, so deepa more than anything i want to thank you for giving us the biggest gift which is your time and I know how busy you are, uh, especially now. And I really want to thank you for it. Uh, and I want to thank our, um, our audience as well for joining us, for staying with us, and uh, uh, for being part of this conversation. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Lakshmi. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.